Hey everybody, my name's Katie. And I'm DL. And we're the Fruchés. And our kids are at school, so we're gonna tell you a little bit about them. Yeah, so. Right. Yeah, it's gonna be great. So our firstborn, Eve, was born, like DL said, without an arm and a leg. Um, her story's just really amazing. At 10 weeks um, pregnant, she survived what the doctors think is called an amniotic rupture. When you're pregnant, like all these like rubber bands come loose and that's how like people can lose an arm. Yeah, they wrap around the body like tourniquets. But she had like a lot of them and we're really blessed that it didn't wrap around her neck or her stomach but she did lose her entire left arm, her entire, left arm, her her entire, entire right, right leg, leg. Um, and then she lost a couple fingers on her right hand. And, and her left leg had severe, I guess you would say like abnormalities, like it made a mm -hmm. complete J when she was born, so it was clubbed, but instead of just being a little bit, like her foot actually curved like that. Yeah, so even after she was born, we spent like every week um, going to the, to the doctor, they took her foot and they just, would start casting it and they just would bend her foot over the course of a year mm -hmm. to where it got you know close to how our foots are. I think I'm, we jumped ahead a little bit. I want to go back in the story a little bit to the 25 week mark. Okay so so I was 25 weeks pregnant and through a series of um, not important events we found ourselves in an ultrasound room really for the first time with the doctor telling us that what they were seeing were severe abnormalities, I think was one of the terms she used, and explained to us that from what they could see on the ultrasound, they weren't sure if Eve was gonna be compatible with life. Um, they weren't sure if delivering a baby, um, if that was gonna compromise my health, and there were just a lot of unknowns. And I remember going back into the doctor's office as we were just trying to like process everything and our, like everything was just spinning. Yeah, at the time they gave her only a 10% chance of living more than a day or even a few hours outside the womb. Um, and, and I remember at the time too, the doctor was like, really just trying to help us understand like a whole picture. And so she started saying things like, you know, we need to remember that there are two patients involved here, that we've got a mommy and a baby. And we need to think about what delivering the baby's gonna mean for Katie and like what's gonna happen with her and I think that was the first time I realized that we were, you know, living in like what always seemed like it was a hypothetical situation of like the mother's life being in jeopardy. Like suddenly it was like in the midst of like a 30 minutes time span, suddenly like we were living that. Yeah, I, I remember the doctor made it really clear that it was taking a risk to your life and, and that, you know, she was really clear that she wanted you to make a choice and that, that there was a choice that needed to be made in, in this case. And, and I remember that you, know, you chose, you wanted to go through with everything. From then on, it was, it was a pretty whirlwind journey. Because it was a super high-risk pregnancy, our OBGYN decided that we needed to go to what she called the Lamborghini of ultrasound. That was her term. And, into the perinatologists, which are the baby experts. I ultimately had tested potentially positive um, for some kind of scary things. And so there was a good bit of concern that if I gave birth that I might start bleeding and they wouldn't be able to stop it in time. And so it got to be a pretty, um, pretty intense time. I remember that delivery, it was crazy. Yeah, so and I guess we'll tell them about how the delivery went and that will kind of conclude Eve's section of the story. Yeah. It was very quick because, you know, we were at the sonogram with our, you know, you know, hospital bag in case we need to stay. And this time the doctor was like, okay, I'm seeing things. Y'all are not driving back to Fort Worth today. Uh, we're gonna induce um, and you're gonna have the baby. And I guess the main thing we want to tell them, I remember there were seven doctors in the it room. It was huge. like. There was, I mean, no one really imagines giving birth to an audience, and that's where I found myself. One of the big things they were really worried about was that Eve had suffered a stroke. That was one of the mm -hmm. big concerns. And so she's got one arm, and every time they would look at her on an ultrasound, they were like, well, it looks like it's just kind of withered up. We're not sure she's ever going to be able to. So, so when she was born. So I had a really great doctor. I safely delivered. Eve came out and the whole team like, you know, jumps in and grabs her and they run off and we had already agreed that whatever was going to happen, D DL was going to go with Eve and my mom was going to stay with me 
And so he kind of walks with them over and they take Eve on this table. And the first thing they do is get this flashlight and start shining it in her eye, check in for all these things that they thought were gonna be wrong with her. And the very first thing Eve does, and this is so true to who she is today, isn't it? Like, she's like, get that light out of my face. Yeah, and so when she moved her arm, it was just amazing. Yeah. And it was and just that moment where like, we knew she was okay. That we knew that we had made it through that and in that one moment we saw how beautiful her face was. No scars, no, mm -hmm. no cleft palate or anything like that. And yep. this beautiful hand and arm that worked. And the next thing that we saw was all the doctors they just started left. leaving. There were like eight doctors who just left the room. It was kind of like the ultimate wah, wah, wah. But we were happy with <laughs> the wah, 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 whatever because it was good for it us. It was great. So like within about 45 minutes of Eve being born, it was just us. And it was really, it was great. That's and then uh, Felicity has a different story, so I guess we'll, we'll get into that. Yeah. Our five-year-old Felicity uh, was born two years after Eve, and her, um, you know, her disabilities are much worse. So, you know, severe brain damage. And, um, and so, like, when I'm talking to a kid, what I tell them is that Felicity's brain damage causes, like, when we do things, you know, our brain sends our muscles a message and the muscle obeys right away. Felicity's brain and her body have a horrible time communicating. They just really can't. But Felicity has a lot of joy. We call her Lissy, and um, she just smiles so much. And why don't we give them the um, story of how we found out about what, you know, how she was going to be the way she is. Okay. Because the first pregnancy was high risk, they sent us back to the Lamborghini of ultrasounds, this time only once a week instead of twice. And I remember thinking, they're looking for everything. Like, they're gonna find something even if it's not there. Yeah. So at about 20 weeks along, they found what they thought was signs of brain damage. And they're like, let's just keep looking at it every week. And by the time we had the birth, at about 40, the doctor was like, everything's perfect. We delivered, it was really uneventful, it was a pretty cool, easy day, and the next day they moved me into a regular room. The pediatrician on that floor noticed that I had had some issues in my blood work, so wanted to run some tests on Lissy just to be sure that she was okay. And sure enough though, that blood work they ran on her did show that she had contracted a virus while in utero called CMV. And they were like, man, we've got to do a whole lot of testing now. Uh, people came in in hazmat suits and put our daughter into okay. a container. container. Like, like, a like an alien or something. And like in the hazmat suits, they took her from the hospital into an ambulance. They got her to the um, children's center. Hospital, we were in the NICU. Um, and in so this, quarantine because yeah, of the virus. So they started running a lot of tests and I mean, really the only thing I can say is it just got darker and darker from there. She had a lot of brain damage. She had some cysts on her brain. Um, just, there are a lot of problems. Yeah, and then, so it was very different than with Eve. With Eve, it was perinatologist tri twice a week and we started with 90% chance Eve would not live more than a couple hours out of the womb. And then with Lissy, it was perfect baby, you know, she'll be a cheerleader, she'll be so helpful to her sister, and you know, and then it kind of, you know, it, it kind of became... It gone. Like, it was like, we knew that the baby that we thought we delivered wasn't there anymore. Like, that future was gone for her. And like, but we, we had no idea what future laid ahead of her. Even without having a brain that works really well, still has all this joy, still has more makes joy a big impact on people. people. Share a few takeaways that, yeah. we, that we also think are important. Yeah, because there's, you know, we can talk all day long about how awesome our kids are, but we want you guys to know a few things that we've learned along the way. I share a few takeaways. Um, the first thing I think is really important uh, from the special needs community and special needs parents, caregivers, um, you know, with Felicity, she's five and we feed her most of her meals. Uh, we love uh, for her to kind of feed herself. It makes a huge mess and that's okay. So the first thing I wanna encourage everyone with is you know, kind of work on your sphere. You know, like if there are things in your own life that you can do, you know, do those things. So for instance, if you have um, a friend or someone at church who has something similar to Lissy and can't eat well without making a mess, go out to eat with them. Like sit at a table with them where they make a mess and it is okay has given them. We really them. idolize 
normal a lot of times and like it's only okay to be different as long as you're different within the normal boundaries <laughs> you know as long as your hair is a crazy color that's a normal thing to be different of. Mm -hmm. but it's not okay to be different if you're slobbering it's right. not okay to be mm -hmm. different if you've got food dripping out of your mouth or something like that that's gross yeah so uh, work on your sphere like if there's a way that you can help you know help there when it comes to church, uh, something I'd like to share is, you know, there's a percent of the population that has severe disabilities. And a lot of times when we go into church, we don't see that many of them. And that's because it can be hard to get to church. Some of our churches are older and don't have as many handicap ramps. Trying to convey is that it takes that extra 10 minutes every day for school, for church. And if the Sunday school teacher and the teacher at school don't recognize that, then then they can just start to, it's, it's hard. Like that type of stuff can be hard when people just don't understand, you know, differences. So I guess I'm just saying- saying acknowledge what they're going through? Yeah, like acknowledge that, that people's situations are, are different than yours and make them feel more welcome. And I guess just like actually look at that ratio in, in your church or in your youth group. And then, you know, try to figure out, well, how, how can they be a bigger part of our youth group? How can yeah. you go find those people in your school? Make them feel included, like bring them along with you, making sure that your group and your area that you're working includes like an accurate picture of, of how God created the world with, with people of all different colors and shapes and sizes and abilities. Yeah, and but like, don't rush. Like don't, you don't have to fix everything you know, in one day or even in one month or one year, just just be aware and just start start working on it. Pray about it in the sense that you're praying, Lord God, when a parent does take the time to bring their kid to church in, in their wheelchair or, or with this or that condition, like help us just be prepared to welcome them. My last takeaway involves just how you interact with people who have a disability and that is to just remember that when you see someone who is different, like just, especially something you don't encounter very much, it, yeah, it, you have to walk that fine line of like, it takes your brain a while of seeing something different, like a hand that has no fingers, before you can actually see that hand with no fingers. The brain, I think what you're trying to get to is the that brain tells you you've got a natural inclination to stay away from things that look different or, or off. Mm -hmm. Especially when it involves the human body. Yeah, and I think what you're trying to say is the only fight against that. Fight against it, but that's hard because, and that's why it's so important to do things in the sphere that you're actually in, because if you're in the mall and you see someone who's different, you know, you're in staring, like, that's not good. <laughs> but if you're at church and someone comes in, you know, you can welcome them and say, I'm so glad you're you're in our church. And and that's where you can you can start to get comfortable around people who are different, like who, who, who do drool because of something going on um, with their, with their brain. And, and you can, you can realize, you know, that's just, it's okay. It's okay. And it's okay. <laughs> because you know what it's like having people stare at you, like it's uncomfortable. And that's, that's that feeling that people are, are feeling. And a lot of times that's why they're not in church as much or not in public as much because like a lot of us, when, when we have like a, you know, bad hair day or, or like a bad pimple or something that we'd like, I'm not gonna go in, in public, you know, for a day or two or for a week that much, you know. I'll go to the mall next week or wherever I go. I'll go next week, I'll just put it off, stay home. We don't want people with disabilities staying home because they're tired of being stared at. Um, so let, let's just keep working on that. And now let's get to your takeaways. I think that this discussion ultimately hinges on talking about the value and dignity of life and especially for us, for kids who, you know, potentially could have been aborted in a third trimester abortion or something like that and, it, you know, we went on and had, you know, permanent disabilities and things like that. What are some takeaways that um, you can help be a part of what we call like a holistic pro-life approach We're making sure that there, we speak and validate the beauty and truth of that person's life, no matter how long or you know what quality of life that is, that they are made in the image of God, that they have value and beauty and worth. And there are ways, I think, very tangibly, that the church can help be a better part of that. One of the things that's really been a lot to me is when people have gone out of their way to fall in love with her, and they really have. 
and they just love her because that's Lissy and they love her laugh and they love to go and just make her laugh and one of them is a boy in our youth group and it's the most unlikely pair of all of the ones I could imagine but you know he just loves to come and just watch her laugh and he chases her around and they play tag and stuff like that and he just loves to do that and that's something you guys can do too like just Go out of your way to get to know somebody who's a little different. Um, I've never, ever known someone who's done that and regretted it. There's such beauty sometimes in the different. And we don't really know it's there until we are willing to lean in and try to be a little uncomfortable, a little vulnerable, to be like, I don't really know how this is going to work, but like, I really wanted to be, invest in this. And so if that's something you guys can do. Just make a friend and offer to like hang out with them or watch them or babysit them. Um, that is a beautiful way to minister not only to that person and get to invest in their lives, but it also is a huge blessing to the family in a way that I can't really explain to you. Final thought, um, one of the most influential persons in my life was a little boy who passed away right before his seventh birthday. And I actually never even had a conversation with him. Um, he never did anything physically for me, but for I say all this to say he was severely disabled and he had a lot of challenges, but what he had was this contagious joy um, and a smile that literally would just reach across the screens and just pull you out of depression, pull you out of all sorts of hard times. and. He being so joyful, even though he probably suffered, not probably, he did suffer more in his little six years than most people do in a lifetime. His ministry to me had very tangible like effects on my life. It helped pull me out of some really dark places as I was grieving with Lissy. It helped me be a really good mom to her. It, I would like to think, has an effect on other people as now I'm sharing my ministry and our story with other people and Lissy and the joy that she has. All of those are ripples coming from one little boy who from all outside appearances had nothing to offer. He was completely dependent on caregivers for everything, but he was able to give this life that just kind of came from him without even trying. He was pulling out the best in us. And I think that's what is so beautiful about the image of God and this dignity that all of us have. And that's why we speak to just say every life is beautiful. Every single person has something that they can offer and it doesn't depend on their ability to think well. It doesn't depend on their ability to run well or do things you know, physically. That there's just this beauty to the human life that we can't even begin to wrap our minds around. But when you're willing to kind of lean into that a little bit and look for that beauty, it's just mind blowing to see how far reaching it can become and how beautiful it is. Yeah, the, the ripple effects of love, the ripple effects of, um, of these children and their parents and the church and the society that is around them and supports them, it's definitely a picture of God's love. And I think a lot of times it's true that people see God's love more in what we do than it yeah. is what we say. And, you know, I'd encourage you in, in the places you can, look, pray, uh, see these families and try to be, you know, the hands and feet of Jesus to them and allow them to be the hands and, and feet of Jesus to you. Yeah. And the smile of Jesus. The smile of Jesus. It's a lot of joy. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. I think that's great.